Ryan, you may begin. Thank you, sir. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to some. On behalf of the U.S. Commercial Service, in coordination with the District Export Councils of New Jersey, San Diego, and Connecticut, we welcome all of you to the sixth webinar of our 10-part export compliance series um, during World Trade Month. Today's webinar is titled Developing a Corporate Export Management and Compliance Program. My name is Brian Beans. I am your host for today's session. The producer of this series is Mr. Tony Sargis. Um, before we begin, get into the housekeeping and then introducing uh, our subject matter expert, a quick uh, overview of where we've been, where we are, and where we're going. Let's stay with where we're going. Um, Thursday, we're going to do site visits, enforcement actions, and voluntary disclosures. Uh, Wednesday, next Wednesday, excuse me, export controls at trade shows. Very important topic, I feel, and through my experience, a uh, decade long, uh, this one is should have more people should know about this one in my in my uh, my opinion. And then lastly, we'll or not lastly, uh, Thursday or next Thursday, we'll go with uh, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. We'll have a uh, expert speak on that. And then lastly, we'll have the majority of our uh, subject matter experts for all for all the the ten part session or series, excuse me, return and uh, all the participants or excuse me, all the audience can. Uh, ask a question to the compliance professional. Uh, and then we'll also have a special agent with the export enforcement uh, arm of the U.S. Department of Commerce International Trade Administration with us as well. Uh, you should attend that if you can. Uh, that's a good one. Um, okay, a couple house, uh, housekeeping items. Everyone is currently on listen-only mode. This session is being recorded, recorded. If you object, please disconnect at this time. Participants can write in questions at any time into the Q&A feature, we'll dissect and see what questions we can ask, uh, or excuse me, answer. Um, and then lastly, the views and, and opinions expressed in this presentation may not reflect the official policy or position of the US government. Uh, let's welcome in today's subject matter expert, Jose Abrantes, Senior Manager, Global Trade Compliance with OFS, and Jose is also the current chair of Connecticut's District Export Council. Welcome, Jose. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, hope you are having a great day. Um, <clears throat> we've done this uh, this uh, webinar topic uh, a couple times uh, by now, and I think is always one that has uh, some good questions and. Um, Especially for those of you that may be new to the to the compliance world, so uh, hope you'll get uh, some uh, something out of it. Um, when you're looking at trade compliance or import export compliance within your organization, I can always come up with one or two or sometimes multiple uh, regulations that are impact different departments within my company. Um, so it could be manufacturing, how they're manufacturing, legal uh, management, uh, the procurement team, the entire supply chain, customer service, um, R&D engineering, sales and marketing, trade shows like was mentioned before, logistics, shipping, receiving, finance and accounting. So there's a lot of rules that will impact um, different organizations, uh, departments within your organization. So it's important to 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 make sure that your trade compliance team is not isolated, and then they're not doing something that no one else knows what it is, um, that they actually are embedded in the organization and the information can flow out properly uh, as new regulation regulatory requirements may show up. Um, so how your organization is structured um, could, be, uh, could be different. Sometimes it could just be the trade compliance telling other departments, this is what you need to do uh, in your procedures and processes to make sure that we, we're, this is happening, that we are compliant. So, but it's a key part of any organization to, to have that uh, availability. A couple of things I want you to keep in mind. There are three key rules uh, to, on the export compliance world that you should uh, remember. Uh, one is do your diligence. Uh, anytime um, there's a possible violation, um, the one of the first questions is, have you done your due diligence 
and if you have processes and things in place to make sure that this doesn't happen, right? So you can't be a victim of inactions like, oh, uh, and you have to do your diligence to make sure you are aware of this export control uh, requirements and that you have something in place. Second one, know your customer. Know who you're doing business with, understand uh, your supply chain, uh, and so that will make it a little more easy, or make it easier for you to avoid any exposure. The third one is do not self-blind. Do not block the flow of information so you, um, you know, don't ask, uh, so you, they won't tell you anything illegal may happen. That is not uh, a proper uh, way of, of safeguarding, make sure you don't do anything wrong. So the, keep these three things in mind. Um, and the BIS has spent quite a little bit of time and resources putting some guidelines on these these three dot, uh, these three key rules. So keep those in mind as we go along today. So it's developing a uh, export compliance program in your company in a, in a manual. The biggest thing is management commitment. Okay. Any trade compliance uh, program or export compliance program, I tend to do trade compliance because I do both import and export. Today we're talking about mostly export, uh, but I'll use the term uh, interchangeably. So I have a start with a trade compliance policy or export compliance policy. Um, should be signed by the CEO, um, should be distributed throughout the organization. If possible, post it in accessible locations where employees can see it, review it. Uh, schedule reviews um, of the policy and revised policy as needed. You know, are you going to do it maybe on the every year comes up? Um, every year comes up, you have the, the new date, have a sign, review it, any changes. Um, yeah, I had a new CEO coming in this year, so I had to update it anyways. But we also had Russia and Belarus that we needed to be added as uh, as locations that we don't operate in. So uh, if there's nothing to change, then you can just change the date, disseminate as create awareness. So that's part of the second one is management awareness. Now you have a policy, right? You need to have some awareness of that policy, but also the requirements and procedures that come with it. So training. Don't just train the people that are actually doing the, the work, um, but actually uh, train management about the requirements. Report issues on a regular basis, whether you have access to a uh, compliance committee or board meetings, make sure that you identify a risk and uh, issues in your company and, and you escalate it. Make sure that they are aware of what's going on and, and then what are your um, create goals and objectives around compliance and, you know, clear escalation guidelines for when something's wrong with the company, things can move up all the way to the, the CEO, but whoever the managers. Compliance office, officer, not all companies have a compliance officer, uh, but I clearly identify who in the company is responsible for enforcing trade compliance rules. Um, to getting the update regulatory updates to go to conferences and then to disseminate all this information throughout the company. Create a supporting structure on different site levels with either site advocates or compliance personnel, depending on the size uh, of your structure, but make sure that every site has someone that uh, is your compliance champion. Um, larger companies will be able to have uh, compliance individuals in export compliance individuals in all the sites um, but others won't so at least make sure that someone could be your local champion that at least knows a little bit more about the procedures and how to escalate so why is this matter why it matters to the ceo and to the executive team there, there's a risk the biggest risk the biggest risk for the companies is you know bad bad advertising bad publicity, uh, your product ends up in uh, North Korea, it comes out on the news, everyone knows, and now you may or may not have done anything wrong, but uh, there's some bad publicity coming in there. And 
obviously with potential violations, then there's the risk of fines and penalties. And those have been up upgraded now to, I believe, $347,000 per violation for a BIS violation. So one export transaction may have four or five violations. So you may have, um, you may have failed to apply for an export license. You have may have failed to screen and you've done business with someone that is on the denied party list that you screened. You, you failed to file the EAI properly and, you know, one export, one sales order could be five different violations times $345,000. So you can that add up fairly quickly. Then the other one is the export denial privileges and, you know, which would impact companies uh, in the U.S. significantly and then possibly jail time for some of the individuals in the corporation. So there's a high risk there. So you always sh should waive these, not too much. You don't want to be, um, you don't want to be um, cry wolf all the time uh, or the sky is falling, but you should use sometimes opportunities in the news that may be of a competitor or something that is related to you to highlight some of these to your senior uh, executives. So the first thing, well, second thing, you gotta do a compliance policy, export compliance policy, and then you have to do a risk assessment. You really gotta do, uh, dig in deep, uh, know your product, know your customer, your industry, um, map out, your internal process, uh, map out your sales distribution network, identify your logistic partners, uh, review the compliance guidelines and measure your program again, and, and really identify areas of improvement. So do a, a, a ongoing risk assessment. So know your product. One of the companies I worked for, um, my first company on doing export compliance was Canberra Industries and there were nuclear radiation detection equipment. I knew my product. It was radiation, nuclear radiation detection uh, equipment that was going to nuclear power plants. And a lot of our customers were in Russia, India, Pakistan, China, Israel. So I was very aware um, of my customer in my industry and the risk associated with that. Right. So if you have, you know, if you are a book publisher and maybe your risk is going to be a lot less than if you're doing nuclear radiation detection equipment uh, with optical fiber right now, um, I have mixed because we have telecommunication product, very low risk, uh, very low controls, but then we also have other products and we'll go into that. Um, so do a risk assessment, do a self-analysis, uh, and really try to understand where you are um, as far as a risk level, and then address address your risks, put your priorities there, and you know leave some of the other stuff behind. So on part of your risk assessment, you need to ask these fundamental questions, and I ask these in every time I'm looking at a transaction. Um, Country, country restrictions, where I'm shipping this to. Am I potentially shipping this to a embargoed country? Um, do I do business with any Cuba, Iran, North Korea, Sudan, Syria, Russia, Belarus? Well, there are country restrictions. Am I impacted by those or not? Um, then product restrictions. What is my product? Is my product controlled to those countries or to the country that I'm shipping it to? Um, a product may be restricted to go to China, but not to Japan, right? Uh, then I look at the end users. Who, who is my customer? Is the customer that I know and trust? Is it a new customer that I probably should know more about? Um, and so you got to look at that, those, those questions. And then at the end, uh, what's the application? For what purpose uh, are, am, are my products being used? Um, is there a potential risk for a weapons of mass destruction or a military application, um, which military application may be okay, depending on the product, but it's good to understand the whole picture. So you understand those four questions, 
you're probably going to be uh, okay. And then we talk a little bit about, you know, country specific controls, you know, where are the countries that I don't business do business with, whether they're restricted or embargoed. Um, Russia, Belarus are the new ones now, or any occupied region, uh, region of Ukraine, territory in Ukraine that is occupied is also restricted. But there also there are big other countries of concern, countries that you can do business with, like China, uh, but there may be some players there that you may be restricted. But many other countries have specific restrictions that you should review uh, depending on the product, of nature of your product. And then have some system control uh, if you have that possibility of flag or, or block embargo countries or restricted destinations and establish when orders are allowed to be entered. Those are all things that you should put in barriers around it. Then you need to understand your product, right? Um, in the US, um, most products will fall under Department of Commerce or Department of State. Um, so you need to, you are allowed to self-classify, um, go to the regulations and, and define if your product is ITOR or EAR, and then within the EAR, come up with a product classification number on it. Um, you have to substantiate your assessment and, and document it. But if you're not sure, if there's any doubt, then you should go for a commodity jurisdiction with the Department of State, and they will tell you whether something is ITAR inter under the Department of State, belong to international traffic and arms regulations, or is part of uh, the export administration regulation is controlled in the BIS. So the formal CJ commodity jurisdiction that you file with the Department of State will make that determination for you. And then if it is BIS, if it's the power of commerce, then you can go again for a formal CCATS, a commodity classification assessment that they can review your proposed ECCN and they'll tell you uh, if that's a correct one or not. So, especially at the beginning, as you have new products, it's good to have those structured. And then after that, you can do like items uh, for similar products. And then you have to establish a licensing matrix by the product. So if your product is controlled, you have to set up controls around products, require licensing for further review, set up controls to protect technical data from foreign nationals, and set up controls for classification of like items during a part creation. Uh, someone creates a new version uh, of this product. And, you know, we had laser cavity. Let's say laser that it was, you know, 10, 10 watts, and now the new version is going to be 20 watts. Well, then you, you need to have a new classification review to make sure that is that has the ECCN change. Is the product now more control or less? Or even is the product now military or not? So that's assessment that you do when the new part, a new part can be created or a new product can be created. So you need to identify all these uh, and start documenting and creating processes around it. The other one that you create product processes around it is about end user control. Um, so who you were selling it to, make sure that your customer service, your salespeople have enough uh, instructions uh, to kind of navigate the export controls as well. So I've set up a process or tools where they can collect and user information, um, screen all your transactions, and screen all parties to your transactions against the sanction or restricted parties list. So whether you use a um, a formal tool, there are web providers out there, the service providers that will gather all the uh, all the customer restricted parties, narco trafficking. Um, sanction denied parties lists and i think there's over 30 just in the us alone then you have japan germany the uk the eu the un all of them have lists that put together of individuals that you should stay away for from or that at least you should be um acting cautiously 
uh, maybe a license requirement or something like that may trigger. Department of Commerce, the US government has also put a consolidated list that you can go in and screen as well. Um, so that is, it's fr that one is free um, for the US government lists, but there's other services providers at the different cost levels that you can utilize. Um, I mean, adopt a screening tool, right? Whether it's integrated tool within your ERP system and every time an order is created automatically screening or on any time the what is orders modified or at time of shipping, you automate a screening, a web-based service provider that you can set up uh, maybe a time of order entry or someone in your company that screens all the parties to the transaction, making sure uh, that you do that. Obviously, the system works. You put in all your customers, as handsome as they are here, and it compares against all the evil bad guys with evil mustaches there like this guy here, and you will potentially have a match. Uh, and if there's a match, we'll block the order uh, for you to review, and then you can either clear it because it was a false positive, or uh, if it's something that you need to be concerned, there's something that you have to act on. The goal here is not to transact with a party that had could be denied or restricted by the US government. And this goes both on the selling side, but also on the purchasing side as well. So then you do your screening and then you have to, to really collect and use information. Um, is the end use appropriate for the commodities? There are a lot of, so if you think of someone from Belarus or Russia, up until a year ago, they were able to buy your product with, without any restriction. Um, and now they are banned, um, So, in, but they still want your product. So instead of, of, of buying it directly, or they may they try and you said no, they'll, they'll go to um, a company in, in Thailand or in China and say, hey, buy this for me. Um, so you gotta look at the transaction, if there's any red flags um and provide your team with the training and tools for them to identify red flags and how to report those red flags to you um, really a red flag could be anything a signal that suggests the possibility of a violation is taking place or, or will take place um so we got to be watchful of those as they pose a risk for for your company um of a possible uh, legal exposure if you do business with someone that you shouldn't be. So, I mean, a red flag really can be anything uh, in mind. So, with one of my old companies, we we sold uh, liquid liquids mass liquid chromatographers or mass spectrometers, and one of the big red flag we got all the time was someone that was buying it from the U.S. but uh, yet. They want it to be in, um, uh, you know, 120 volts, uh, or, you know, buy to a different market and they're claiming 120 volts or 220 volts. They were buying the wrong voltage for the market that they were telling us it was going to be installed, or if installation is required and. Uh, typically, some more technical expertise is needed, and they'll say, oh, don't worry, we'll, we'll take care of it. Um, so that's something, a couple of red flags. Sometimes they'll make sense. Um, just make sure that uh, you clear the red flags. Again, going back to those three rules, do not self-blind. You keep asking questions until you are able to satisfy your curiosity and you clear the red flags. Uh, or um, you know, sometimes they may say, you know what, uh, it's not worth it to me. There's too much, too many red flags. It's really too risky to go here. Um, so one of the questions that I got is if you sell a distributor who resells to end users, how important is end user identification? How much detail do we need to get? So is how how far down you go down the supply chain? And that was a good question here. Um, you need to have a mechanism, right? To cover that you have done your due diligence. 
um, if he is a reseller or a distributor, then you need to have an agreement with that reseller um, or that distributor that if they are going to sell, they need to follow US export rules um, and provide them links to where the information is. What do you do? I've done with companies um, reseller annual reseller training uh, where there was opportunity where there are all our distributors and resellers were trained annually on a lot of our products and trade compliance came in and kind of trained them as well on the export or re-export requirements. Um, the US government does require to have a diversion for any control product to be a diversion uh, clause um, on the on the bottom, the commercial invoice that is there to for them as a reminder. Um, so if you know that you're selling it to somebody and they are going to resell it, you know, are you comfortable with that? Are you comfortable that with that party knows and understands US export regulations? Um, and that just because the product is now in Hong Kong, it still needs to follow US export rules. So you got to make sure uh, of that. So in this case, for the red flags I was talking about, when you don't know or you have reason to believe the violation is going to happen. But if there are distributor resellers that you have agreements, you can put in your agreements that they pass on that responsibility to them as well. So you need to develop an export management system, okay? An internal control plan. Um, don't be like this book here. Uh, it says, read me on it, all nice and dusty. A lot of companies, uh, there are service providers that will create an export management system for you. Um, if it's a canned book that reads really well, uh, but doesn't, no one in your company knows what it is and where it is, then it doesn't do you any good, right? You can have the most perfect manual, uh, but if no one follows it, it's just collecting dust, doesn't mean anything to you. So make sure that you have a, a set of written policies and procedures that one, state what you do, okay? And then do what you state. If you, if you state that you're doing something, I should be able to go into your company and you should be able to, and I should observe that on a daily basis. So again, this is not a beauty contest, uh, how good your, your, your manual is, but the more of, do the people in your company know where this manual resides? Uh, does it get updated often? Um, and does people are following what is there? So the key is when you have a new procedure or a new policy that is disseminated of information that you conduct training um, that is uh, impact for those individuals that are impacted for each procedure. So not everyone needs to be trained on any every trade compliance procedure. Uh, maybe only the procurement needs to be trained on a specific procedure or shipping on another one, right? But they also have to be trained and they have to have access to the manual. Um, so update the information as needed um, and review it on a regular basis. Mandate annual review of the procedures to make sure that if things have changed, um, that you update it, but you also get a fresh look at it. Maybe you say, you know what? We have changed our way to doing things. I need to change this procedure. Um, neither the way I'm doing things is wrong, neither the procedure, I just need them to match. And then where, um, where'd you put this manual? Whether it's part of the ISO procedure, part of the corporate procedure within the trade compliance team, within individual department procedures. Uh, one thing that, that um, I learned is, you know, if you're part of an ISO procedure and Every time that you find a non-conformity on the ISO procedure is mandated that you have to report, um, maybe that's not something you want to do. Um, so you got to have some flexibility to be able to navigate without having to go to the government every time you find something wrong. Um, 
where again i think it's more important that one is accessible to your people they know where it is and it's accessible to the government in case of an audit as well so this is just an example i i've I had a discussion once that someone had a procedure that it was just flow charts the entire manual had each individual process instead of a written down with all the rules and regulations of what they do they had a flow chart for every procedure and that worked for them i have a little bit combination of both uh, i think some procedures work great right on a flow chart more than a regulatory or sometimes I put the regulatory requirements and then I kind of put the flow. There's no right or way, wrong way to do this um, as far as what format, but it'd be something that is fluid that people can read and understand. Key for me is training, training, training. I went, I had a new global logistics uh, guy that he went with me to one of my sites uh out of the country and i was giving the, them a training on trade compliance and i at the beginning before everyone showed up i looked at them and say listen at some point in time someone's going to say wow this is really interesting i wish i've known this before and they're going to say this despite the fact that i was here last year and i gave them the exact same training sure enough someone said this is really useful information thank you um, he, he started laughing afterwards because, uh, I had predicted. So sometimes the message doesn't sink. So just because you, you gave a training when you created a procedure three years ago, there are change in personnel. People just have their other things to do in their life. Don't expect people to, to just be a sponge that absorb everything. Um. Make sure that you do repeat a training throughout your organization. And who should you train? Okay. Train, train the trade compliance department. So if you have an import export compliance department, budget so they can go at least an annual conference or seminar a year. Um, there's lots of webinars, there's some free webinars, just being one of them, not you know, that is very affordable. Um, there are annual conferences. Make sure your team goes out there that they get learning from best practices and that they're bringing that back to your company. Uh, management training, seek opportunities to educate upper management. Maybe it's not in a sit down actual training. It could be, that would be great if you can get them there, but maybe internal audit reports, incident reports, board meetings, seek opportunity to always train and educate, create awareness in your management team. Then go to specific job training function, training related to uh, the shipping department or training related to a specific procedure within the shipping department. We're going to talk about free trade agreement uh, qualification process. So function specific to a function, specific to a procedure, and then any regulatory updates. If he has a new regulatory update, use that to kind of reinforce your procedures in your training. Okay. And then create general awareness training, um, new hire employees, basic awareness training um, for all employee meetings, department meetings, newsletters. So I try to do like a three tier where I have general awareness. I want everybody to know a little bit about trade compliance. Then I have job specific training, people that need to understand requirements regulatory requirements for the day-to-day -day function and then at the top the uh compliance department team they need to be more um in-depth training uh from conferences and things like that so i try to, to to make it so there's awareness all across but then i put the emphasis where the emphasis ought to be record keeping Record keeping is really what proves your compliance. Um, so here, and this is our records keeping department. Um, so do you have, do you understand, um, do you understand all the records that you need to keep for an export transaction? 
And do you know where they are? If you are to have an audit tomorrow, could you grab all the records that the government will come to you uh, within um, 48 hours and provide all the documents we're talking? So if you don't have a good record keeping, you cannot provide um, evidence of your records, then it's like you don't have a compliance program. So it, it is that important. Uh, you need to be able to, if your product ends up in Iran and the U.S. government comes knock on your door and say, hey, um, why is this particular product in this destination? Or do you, I, or with a picture of your product and you need to be able to say, well, I didn't sell it to them. And backtrack if they provide you some information and say, I sold it to this company in Belgium. And this is what they told me on this end user, end user statement that they're going to use it for. And so you need, and so you become, instead of being a, a, spec, a suspect in an export uh, violation, you become a partner with the US government um, to, to find this diversion and all the additional parties to the transaction. And it's much better to be a partner in investigation and be the subject of investigation. I guarantee you that. Um, so if you have your records, you can show your records, you can prove your compliance. That is very important. So where any company conducting international business is legally bound to retain their records, okay? Um, so what records do you must be retained? All documents related to import or export transactions, such as quotes, purchase orders, sales orders, export licenses, uh, export declaration, the, like EAI, filing, transport documentation, payment information, um, any additional licenses. So since different departments are responsible for different records and to avoid duplication, you need to know where the records are and who keeps each record. Maybe you have them all in a central location. That has not been my experience. So you need to put a matrix together to say, oh, if I want purchase uh, proof of payment, finance has them, they have them electronically, they keep them for at in this fold, this folder, electronic folder, or they keep them at this um this room in the locking cabinet and they keep it by year or by customer by year and they keep it for five years right you also have to make sure that you keep the records for at least five years from the time of exportation uh, that is requirement but sometimes it could be more for instance if an instrument comes for repair and you send it out then it's now five years from the time of the last transaction, not the original transaction. So you have to adjust things like that. So make sure you have a matrix. For you have a list of all the documents that you need and make sure that you uh, understand where these records are maintained. Uh, clarify the legal record period for each record, identify each department and let them know you are accountable to keep this record for five years, if you change your record method, you need to inform me so I can update my matrix. Identify the location where the records are kept, hard copy or electronic. You do that for all the departments that are responsible for keeping everything. Obviously, you can also create a central location where all the records go. Um, that could take a little more of a combination of efforts there. So, third party service providers. So, either extend your record keeping procedures to your third party service providers or request a copy of all your records. Okay. Um, I hear this a lot. Uh, I don't keep my records. My freight forwarder keeps them for me. Um, they keeping it for their own record keeping requirements, not for yours. Um, you can utilize them. Sometimes you may have to pay to retrieve the records. Make sure you understand um, how much you have to pay per record. Um, sometimes they'll say, okay, with free for the one year, but if I have to go back to five years, you need to pay, you know, $50 per record or $10 per record, whatever you needs to. 
I prefer to keep them in house because it's my record keeping requirements. But if you are doing the third party service provider, you make sure that you extend your requirements and you test them, test your record keeping, um, not just the third parties, but yourself. If you have a matrix that says, you know, Joe in finance is keeping this record from, you know, for five years, hard copy, pull a random order, do a sam of, uh, kind of a sample and say, can you give me the PO that we received for this transaction, this sales order, um, check how fast the records can come to you um, and go back to the limits to see, can you really provide um, the records from five years? Um, in the in my company uh, that you know they had a lot of space, so every time the shipping area kept moving uh, every couple of years to a different area, and every time they moved the shipping area from one location to the other, they left the records behind, um, and it was just like there was just an abandoned area. So if you want the records from six, five, six years old, you would go to they are all supposedly in this location. And if you want the records from three years old, you go to this other location and the most recent ones would be in the new location. Uh, unless someone needed to clear out space and it's like, oh, there's all this stuff here and just destroy it. That's the other thing uh, is destruction of records, right? Um, if there's anything past five years, seven years for tax, so make sure that your policy also addresses other people that may need your records, like your finance group, they may need it for seven years for tax. So you may just have a global overview about your record keeping that accommodates all the departments. Uh, but also make sure that you have a destruction date. If you, in case you have an audit and they come in and all of a sudden they start pulling records and they find records that are 10 years old, that's all admissible because those records are available for them. Okay. Other things you need to keep in mind that kind of people don't think about it as record keeping um, necessarily, but you know, your ITAR registrations, uh, keep registration up to date, review information on the application renewal, update uh, your, if you have a new CEO, a new CFO, update all that information. Um, Power attorney, restrict the power attorney to trusted carriers and forwarders. When I started in my current company, they had 27 customs brokers with power attorney. This is ridiculous. If anyone wanted a power attorney, they would just sign it and give it away. So eventually we start cutting that off to be down to four that we have now and really two predominant. So do ne never issue an evergreen power attorney. Um, two years is an acceptable period. Uh, if you have a lot of evergreen out there, you can issue a letter that you are recalling that power of attorney. Keep track of who has power of attorney to act on your behalf. This is both import and export for filing EAI, for being uh, to doing a lot of uh, other things for you. Uh, other registrations, ACE, if you do your own EAI, um, then licensing sites, BIS, NEPAR, DDTC. Make sure that's part of your record keeping that you have something, someone that has all those administrative powers and keeps all these up to date. Wouldn't be a good compliance system if you didn't audit, if you didn't monitor and you didn't review and reassess. So monitor all the time. Don't wait for an audit, annual audit to find errors. If you have annual audits, uh, you know, create monthly reports, spot check for anomalies on your procedures, uh, make sure your whole program, not just procedure, but, you know, spot check, make sure people are doing what they're supposed to do. Um, audit, uh, schedule regular audits to test your compliance, uh, train and involve corporate auditors if possible. Uh, so you're not kind of auditing yourself. Um, have other people kind of may potentially uh, kind of check yourself out. Don't be afraid of the results. You know, ignorance is not a bliss when it comes to trade compliance. Uh, you want to know where the faults are in your program and your internal audits are designed for you to find these issues and fix it, okay? So then you can report results of audit to the management that creates a discussion 
uh, it creates opportunity for for more training and um, just a, a general awareness. So really address any issues and concerns immediately. Uh, measure yourself against yourself, you know, yourself from a year before, but also others as you learn what other companies are doing. Um, check your own program against uh, what others are doing. Look for best practices and opportunities to really improve your program that you have in place. So just kind of keep, I have a schedule, uh, audit schedule, and I, I divide my sites and every year, um, right now, every year, every other year, I'm auditing a site. And so they're gonna get audited, they're going to be getting a report, and then we're gonna find any corrective actions and we're gonna train everyone on any corrective actions. What it helps me also is see a pattern um, uh, of things that I need to work on from a compliance level. So a good, there's a lot more to it. You can do an audit, but a good five-way compliance check is, you know, where's the customer PO? Uh, if there's an export license, where's the license? Uh, where, you know, show me the packing list, show me the commercial invoice, show me the AES EI filing. So is the customer PO, you know, what the customer ordered is what was on the license. Um, is the values match, the quantities match? It was that all listed on the packing list, this packing list, commercial invoice and licensing. Do they match? Do the values match? EAI filing, the whoever is the end user on the EAI is a listed on the commercial invoice is the same party and address listed on the license license. So you do like a quick five way match compliance match by pulling four or five documents related to your export transaction. And you kind of see if, um, if you, you know, if, if everything's okay, you can add more obviously complexity to this by adding, you know, the, the customer, the screening by the finance. If you did a finance background check, a lot of the other things that you can check in this. But I found this uh, a five way compliance match, a, a quick way to do spot check audits on, on transactions. And when I do all my audits, um, I find a quick visual way to, to address with um, yellow, green, yellow, red uh, for the executive team, for the management team in the site leadership. Okay, this is every site. This is where you got green, yellow, red. Obviously, if I have too many yellows on a particular uh, portion, then that's one of the things I'm going to be tackling for that year. Um, the reds I need to address right away, right? Those are the ones that either a violation or a major nonconformity. Uh, the yellows uh, I put a minor noncompliance and the green all being compliance. So immediately I'm going to tackle all the reds. After every audit, I'm, we're going to do a, an audit report and review. We're going to put corrective actions in place. The reds need to be addressed right away. Uh, the yellow could be a recommendations, but also for me, it's like, okay, it seems like a lot of people don't know what's going on with um, anti-boycott. Um, that's something that I need to train. I need to make sure everybody is on board and understand our procedures and process for anti-boycott. This is just a quick way of just sending it to, to the executive team and they can just have a view. So it's just one tool you can develop as many tools, but I really encourage you to do a reporting out uh, on your findings, but also where how healthy your compliance is. Part of the good compliance uh, ma manual and procedure is, um, you know, to if you have a violation, you have to review that potential violation. Um, have someone internally that you know plays devil advocate with you, uh, so you have a pro and a con. Do I disclose or do not disclose? If you decided that a violation has occurred, you know you should do a full disclosure. Um, partial disclosures will not protect you. Um, if you just tell half truth and then they come back and verify and found a lot more skeletons in your closet then that's not good for you. So if you're going to do a disclosure, go back and make sure you lift all the stones 
and make sure that you find all the skeletons in your closet and you tell them all at once. You know, one mea culpa, bring it all to the front. Um, you need to understand the full scope of the problem. You know, do you have the issue anywhere else? If you found a problem in one site, you go to the other sites and say, is everybody doing the same mistake? Um, is there any other issues that, you know, if we're going to do a disclosure, should we kind of look for more and put it all at one out there? Um, there may be some times where, and, and this is just me on the, on the corporate side, not on the government side. I don't work for the government. There may be some times where you find things um, where you can just fix it internally. And it's like, you know what? I don't think this is, yeah, a, a, a small violation may have happened here, but I'm not 100% sure. So I cannot even prove to the government that a violation did happen, but I'm just going to fix the problem, right? That is something that you need to do with counsel, uh, determine with your internal counsel. Um, but if it's a violation, if it's something that is serious, um, you should take advantage of the disclosure. There is a mitigating factor, um, like commerce will give you a 50% discount right away on a violation. Uh, so there's disclosure is a mitigating factor. If you do self disclose, there's a, a reduction and immediate reduction in, in, a, in penalties. And honest cooperation with the government. Again, um, brownie points, I will say brownie points are not on the regs, but I highly believe in brownie points. Um, you do want to, if you find a, a violation, you want to come back, you want to report it to the government, and you want to have that open flow of communication because you want to improve. You don't want to try to hide anything. Disclosures are not a get out of jail free card. Uh, so you need to make sure that everybody understands that there's a risk for fines and penalties. Uh, you should seek legal counsel, internal or internal or outside counsel. Um, but there are potential consequences for doing a disclosure, but doing a self disclosure comes with a, a much uh, easier burden to, to bear, especially with the 50% reduction on the, uh, of the penalties right, right off the bat. Uh, if you do uh, end up in, in, in self-disclose. So you have to think about that. You need to set up a process in your company to say, hey, this is our program. You need to have, you need to make that decision ahead of time. And that should be set up in your manual that if you find a violation, there's a serious violation, you should have a mechanism for escalation and you should have a mechanism to export, to disclose that violation to the government. If that is already embedded in, in the regs, that makes it easier for you. You don't have to make that decision. Uh, if it's already embedded in your procedure in your manual, it's already there, okay? So again, to disclose or not disclose, both Department of Commerce and BIS, sorry, Department of State and, and Department of Commerce, they encourage obviously voluntary self-disclosures and they have an incentive given on the reduction of penalties to do that. I believe last department BIS conference I attended to, they said something about 95 to 98% of, of all self-disclosures. I think 98% of self-disclosures re result in a warning letter. Uh, not anything, not even anything, um, not penalties or anything like that. Just a warning letter. Don't do that again, and and that's it. I mean, obviously, when you do a sell a disclose a disclosure, you also put in corrective actions. Okay, this is what I found. There's there was wrong. This is what I did wrong. But in the meantime, this is all the corrective actions that I put in in place already um, to so this won't happen again. Right. Um, so whether you list corrective actions on disclosure or not is an opportunity to gain visibility within the company of the compliance program and requirements, create awareness of the compliance program efforts and struggles, uh, whether you need more money, whether you need automation, uh, it's a good time to, to ask for more resources um, and really lead effective change in the company. Then correct the actions after an audit. Um, 
create another report, identify issues to be resolved, follow through and training, 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 really uh, have that. So on the escalation guidelines, you know, infiltrate every aspect of your company day-to-day -day operations, make sure you are involved in decisions relevant to trade compliance. Uh, so you need to create awareness about what point, what key points in the company are compliance impacted. Um, for a compliance program to be effective, you, you know, employees need to know who you are or who, who the tr export compliance team is, uh, what do they do, where can they help them, what is expected of them, uh, when to contact you and how to reach you. So create a process where issues can be reported to trade compliance and management, and that should be part of your manual and procedures as well. Uh, if you have mergers and acquisitions, uh, trade compliance should be part of the due diligence review, request any information regarding sales activities of in country of operations, manuals, policies, and procedures for the company that you are buying, uh, review control products and licensing activity, and interview key compliance officials. So. You do a lot of the diligence to make sure that you're not buying. There's a successful liability in the US. So if you buy a company and that company has been operating um, illegally, has done a lot of violations, you now, as the new owner, are responsible for the violations of the company that you bought. So you make sure you do due diligence there. And after the merger, now you have access to a lot more information. You got to go back in and do a full review and verify all the information is corrected. I'm saying that because if you do find something, that's the perfect time to do a disclosure in corrective actions as soon as possible after you bought a company. Say, I bought this company. I found out that they were send, selling all this stuff to Sedan. I did know that before on my, on my review is this disclosure, and this is what correcting after that. So, just an overview. I want to leave some 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 time to go over some questions afterwards. The core elements of an effective export management system. So, starting with management commitment, a continuous risk assessment of the export program. You know, if new products come in or you you buy a new company, you need to do this risk assessment. You have a formal written writ, written export management and compliance program. Uh, manual that is in place, um, do ongoing compliance training and awareness, um, and the key is ongoing, especially these days with so many employees moving from companies to company, you want to make sure that uh, your new hires uh, stay up to date. Pre and post export compliance security and screening, you know, adherence to record keeping regulatory requirements, have an internal external compliance monitor and periodic audits, and maintain a program of, for handling compliance problems, including reporting export violations, and then completing appropriate corrective actions in response to those to any violations that you identify. So you go back on these over and over again, and you document and you create a, a manual. Uh, that supports all these activities and supports your day to day operations. That's for the presentation. I know there was a few questions on the Q and A, um, so we can probably jump on some of those. Yeah, Jose, thank you so much uh, again, everyone. That's Jose Abrantes. He is the senior manager, global trade compliance with OFS. Uh, he is our go-to when it comes to this topic or 